Welcome back to Shapes of Grief with me, Liz Gleason. I'm delighted to be joined today by Kathy Donaghy. Kathy and I are meeting on Zoom anyway for the first time, but we've had several telephone conversations over the last two years. Kathy has just published her first book, Finding My Wild. I'm so delighted that you're here with me today, Kathy. Welcome. Thank you so much, Liz. It's lovely to be with you. I'm a long admirer of your podcast. Thank you, Kathy. And I was only just thinking today, I've just come in, I was out with one of my kids and I was thinking about our history and when we first met and you phoned me one day, I think out of the blue, um, I was walking through St. Stephen's Green in Dublin and my father had just died. I think he had died like 10 days or two weeks beforehand and you got in touch with me as a journalist at that time, um, not as author to ask me a few questions about grief. And I remember sitting down on a bench under a tree in Stevens Green and having this long conversation with you, um, which didn't seem to be about an article at all. It was just two women comparing grief stories and, and talking about grief. Do you remember that? I do, I remember that really well, Liz. And I remember um, what your words really stuck with me because you talked about how, um, that experience obviously was really sad but it was also very beautiful I think that was what I got from it that you had put into you had gone through all these beautiful rituals you had time you left everything else the housework everything else just went by the wayside and you were totally present and in the moment and you I think you were just really grateful for that time so while you were grieving and you still are I'm, I'm sure it's an ongoing process after losing someone so huge in your life I remember thinking, you know, there's a way to do this as well. There's a really way that it can be easier, that, that, that there is such a thing as a good death as you described it. And I, I remember that really resonated with me, um, you know, at the time. I remember thinking, gosh, that's, that's incredible to be able to, to do that. And you sounded so strong, um, mm. such a recent bereavement. And that's what I what I really took from the conversation you, you sounded so strong because it had been momentous and beautiful and that really gave you such hope I think yeah that's so lovely that you remember it that way mm -hmm. and um I I was so grateful at the time because it was during the third lockdown mm -hmm. and so many people were in hospital and my dad could have been in hospital and he wasn't we kept him at home and he didn't have covid and I think actually because we couldn't have visitors, it was so precious because we were just cocooned, myself and my brothers, um, you know, in his home. There was something so beautiful about that. There was no distractions. There was no tea making. There was no sandwich making. There was no entertaining visitors, which I'm sure was awful for some people who would have liked to have come. But selfishly for me, it was a really, really precious time. Um, yeah and it's it's so true that you know when we can move towards something and say okay you know if we have to die which we all do uh how can we make this okay even even beautiful you know yeah a holy moment yeah it really resonated with me um because we had other family bereavements um you know during that period um that you talk about and I know what you mean the wake can be incredibly comforting but I live in a in a part of the world in, in North Donegal where the wake culture is like it's really really strong but I know what you mean about sometimes there's so much to organize that it can almost be a distraction um you know so I suppose everybody has to find their own way through it and navigate their own path that it is so individual you know and what you were describing sounds so momentous that it's hard not to think that that's the right way but you know as you say there's no right and wrong way there's just the way that that you do it it's just our way isn't it you know yeah. and you're so right like for everybody it's so different and it's so personal and mm. I think for every loss it's different and personal you know and had that time not been during lockdown and there had been lots of people around I might be sitting here saying it was just so great there was so many people around and yeah. I guess it's the meaning we make of something as well, isn't it? And for me, like it was a meaningful time and I'm okay with it. And I may have been okay had there been crowds as well. 
Mm, but yeah. Kathy, I really wanted to speak with you because, well, you and I have only ever met in the theme of grief yeah. and loss. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've contributed to two articles mm -hmm. that you've written for the Sunday Independent. Well, I think one was for the Sunday Independent and I think one was for the Irish Independent, which is sort of more, more my home. And, you know, it's funny, Liz, you know, we, we've talked about grief, but I remember so much of our conversations have been peppered with, with laughter and joy as well we've we've managed to um grab the things out of one another's lives uh, you know we, we, we've got snapshots there that have been really um it hasn't all been people think you, you know you're talking about grief it's you know maybe th th there's so much joy there as well in our conversation even though that was the theme and that was the the conversation that we were talking about but i just remember quite upbeat and uplifting conversations and i always came away feeling i learned something from our conversations which which is the greatest joy of being a journalist as well when you can actually come away and feel I I have new tools now in my own personal toolkit um, that I can use in the world you know whatever situation I find myself in and, and that's always a, a great thing you know yeah and it's lovely because as you say that Kathy I'm thinking you know although I spend a lot of my time talking about grief for, for me grief isn't miserable it's not sadness it's not awful it's it's mm. almost a state of deep feeling, of deep sensitivity, you know, of deep awareness, of deep consciousness. Mm. It's like a calling to ourselves, which often only happens in difficult moments, but also I think moments of awe as well. There's that similar call into self. I'm sure John O'Donoghue says something um, a lot more eloquently as I say it, but you know, when I'm talking about grief, it is sort of that, that awareness of being a soul in the world and it's for a short period of time and it's somehow connected with awe and grace and something bigger than just the day to day. I wouldn't, for me, I wouldn't limit to just sadness or a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. And although it can be brutalizing as well, you know, and, and talking about my father's, we started there. That's someone who had lived a very good life, 92 years. That doesn't mean I don't miss him or grieve him, but I wasn't wishing him longer. I wasn't wishing him not to die. He has to die. So what I was wishing him was a really good death. And how can I facilitate that? But for other losses, it's different. You know, when a child dies or somebody is young and dies un unexpectedly or somebody's our treasured person we're just not ready to say goodbye even if they are 92 you know for everyone it's so different and yeah. and so we've started with how it can be for some of us mm -hmm. but also there's a lot more to grief mm -hmm. and usually people listening to this podcast it's because there's something they're looking for they're wanting to learn something there's something paining them and they're looking for an answer. And this is where your book comes in, Kathy, in your life and your stories. So could we rewind to your first experience with profound loss? Mm. Profound loss. Um, in, in, do you mean of, of in my recent life, Liz, or, or, or do you want to you know, go back sort of earlier than that to, to sort of to childhood loss? Or is it is it more, is it more the, in the context of the book that you you you're, you want to start from, really? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the, the question itself brings up so much there as well. We all go through such losses and transitions throughout our lives, and we don't even realize that something we're experiencing is grief or mm -hmm. loss or a transition. And I think especially for when we are children, you know, we can go through a transition or have a loss but maybe because someone hasn't died, we don't really understand that that is a significant loss for us. Mm. But where feels important for you to start, Kathy? Would well, you like to start with the book or is there yeah, something I'll, else? I'll, I'll start with the book. And I suppose, you know, um, in the book, I, in the early chapters of the book, I talk about, and I do think it was, this was triggered by a sense of, 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 of grief or homesickness that I, when I was in my last year of college, Liz, I, um, I became depressed and it, it, it almost came over me. I didn't see it coming. It, it just sort of seemed to just arrive. 
and it, it manifested in me being just exhausted, tired, tearful, um, really not wanting to wake up, not caring whether I woke up or not. And when I was awake, I was so lethargic in the world. I pushed people away. Um, and, and, you know, I got good help. Luckily, I got, I got some, some, some help um, and counselling for the course of that year. And it was kind of amazing that I passed my finals at all because I, I really, really was in the depths of depression. And over the course of that year, sort of learning about what was going on, um, I realised that it was almost like a, a retreat into childhood that, that had been happening. And it was like a grief for an old life that I had cast off. And that life was in Donegal, where I had grown up. And my soul almost belongs in the Michonne, where I grew up. And I have a very deep affinity with, with place and people and the beauty of this, this place. So when I realized that this new life would see me going in a completely different path, it was more than a homesickness. It was almost like a grief for, um, for the life that, yes, I, I wanted to thrive in this new environment and work as a journalist, I hoped, but I didn't know how to do that if I wasn't going to be in Donegal. So there was like a, I can, I felt that was a grief. I, I, it felt like a grief. And it, it definitely, I think it was the, the genesis of that depression, if that makes sense. And I had time over the course of that year to analyze these feelings and it stood me in good stead because I guess I never took my mental health for granted again, you know, and um, it gave me a good understanding of how fragile our mental health can be if we don't look after ourselves or see stuff coming down the tracks. So um, th that felt like my first sort of, um, yes, I had lost, you know, grandparents, but in terms of being lost in a sea of grief, that felt, that felt like a grief. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about in, in, in the book, obviously, you know, then uprooting from Dublin, where we lived and worked as journalists, my husband and I, with our, when our children were small, and relocating back, back to Donegal, and that being sort of like, oh, starting over again. But I suppose my, my feelings of, 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 of real sort of devastation um, and, and a grief came when I, when I experienced recurrent miscarriage. Um, and it's hard to, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, we know how to grieve when we, when we lose some, someone, a person that we, that we love, you know, and I, I have lost people. I love friends and as I said, grandparents and uncles and aunts and the people in my life that were really important to me. But this was like, um, this is like, a, it's almost like society doesn't, doesn't allow you to grieve this it's like you've got to move on pretty quickly because you know there was only only that word is used a lot around miscarriage and one thing I've learned is please never use the word only um, around miscarriage because it can be really all-consuming and for me it happened so there was I, I was in a cycle of pregnancy loss sort of pick myself up enough to try again and the same thing happening over and over again so there, it's almost like there's a grief for the loss of the life that, that you saw for yourself and your family, the loss of your hopes and your dreams. There's also like the loss of, of trust in the world, that things will be okay, that things are going to work out. You have a plan and you're going to try and, you know, get on with the plan, but it doesn't work out like that. So there's a distrust of, 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 of yourself as well. And there's a loss of faith in yourself. And, and that's almost like, a, I suppose it is a grief really, Liz, you know, that you're, you're grieving the little lives that, that you wanted to hold in your arms and they didn't make it that far. But there's, there's also, um, I grieve for my husband not having this child that we long for, for my two sons not being the big brothers that they wanted to be. So you have all that. And as a woman, I think, who goes through this, you, you internalize that, and the grief um, comes out sometimes it comes out as a shame which is quite toxic to yourself sense of self and it can also come out as like lashing raging anger you know um, and that's really it's a tough place to be so yes it was definitely um, and I say this from the point of view as well I had two children I had two boys that were my constant refuge throughout these experiences of grief and loss and I I don't know what it is like to go through these experiences when you don't have little arms to, to wrap around your neck and little hands to hold. And 
I can only imagine that it is worse to have that blind panic. Is it ever going to happen for me? You know, so while I had my two children, you know, the heart wants what it wants. And my heart wanted another child. And it just, you know, we kept losing these babies. And that that became I became like a wild raging beast with with grief. And one of the things I, I do talk about in the book is that I was so angry at the word. You know, I distrusted it. But it manifested as I was raging. If I had seen another pregnancy announcement on social media, I would have screamed. I could have flown phones. I did throw things. Um, and I do talk about in the book that, you know, yeah, I, I'm lucky that the throwing things, nobody got hurt. You know, my heart, heart was the thing that was hurting most. And, you know, I think women are really, really hard on themselves when they go through these experiences that you blame yourself and then the blame comes out of shame and you go through this just this constant cycle of blame shame feeling so bad about yourself feeling you've let everybody down so the grief becomes quite muddled it's in there but it's in there with lots of other feelings and um you know one of the things that i've learned to do um is just feel all the feelings you know just just feel them you know if if it's you know, I, I try to identify shame when I see it coming up and I say, no, you go back in your box <laughs> because you, I do not want you in my life. That is the one that I, but the other feelings, I sort of allow them to, to come over and I just sit with them for a few minutes and I say, it's okay, you know, they'll pass. They're like clouds overhead. They will pass. So I suppose that was, um, that was an experience of, of grief, but it's, it's, it's sort of a, a tricky one because it's not, a person in the world that you loved that is gone in the normal way so miscarriage is kind of like a kind of like a tricky grief you know it's a it's 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 a grief for a life that you wanted and, and you know and and you know for me as soon as the lines were on the positive pregnancy test I, I I was in love with this child that my husband and I were going to bring into the world and have with us on our family and raise so um you know the loss of that was shocking and sometimes traumatic and, and sometimes you know um th there were you know numerous hospital visits that caused a lot of trauma as well so all of these things compounded into this sort of i don't know how, how i would describe it just this really messy sort of tight ball of feelings that i didn't know what to do with so i sort of do what i do in a lot of these situations i start running around like a headless chicken get busy run away from myself, run away from everybody, just keep going, keep on the treadmill, join up for every committee, take on work, just be superwoman. But the truth is, that's, that's not going to work. You're just going to, you're just going to collapse unless you start to unpack some of this yeah. stuff that was going on, you know. When did you collapse, Kathy? I think I just realized that I had to stop running away because I was so unhappy. I was so unhappy with the way of my lot. And that sounds so ungrateful because I have a really wonderful husband and I have two amazing children and we have a, you know, a comfortable home and work that we have purpose in. But you know, all I could see was the broken bits of me. What I thought were, you're not enough without this, you know, new baby, and it's not it's not happening you know so all I could see was a broken fractured self I couldn't see all these gifts in my life because I think when you're when you're grieving you can't really see the wood for the trees so and another thing I was doing I wasn't allowing my husband's pain in and he had obviously suffering as well but I pushed him to arm's length because I think I realized if I had heard his grief, I would have felt more guilty that I had let our family down. That's, that's, you internalize this so much. Um, so I think I stopped running. I think I just, I, I did start to sit with it. And in sitting with it, the first, um, how that kind of came about was I started to go out on my own into nature. And I walked and I swam. And, and you know, you talked earlier about you know, sometimes grief can be, there's, for me, it brought me to a connection with myself and with the natural world. So I started to go out and, you know, no, no distractions, no headphones on, just into the wilds and just walk and howl into the wind or swim in the sea and let my tears mix with the, the salty tears and let it all go and feel all the feelings. And I came back 
a little bit calmer, a little bit quieter. And I was able to, you know, hear what my husband was saying about how he felt. And gradually over time, and time, you know, it is the great healer, you know, it is the cliche, but it is. And so gradually over time, you know, the awe, people talk about the awe inspiring things in life. The, and not even the awe inspiring things. Sometimes it was just the, the quiet things like, you know, watching the starlings on, in the mornings or, or listening, to, watching the beautiful sunrise or just going for, going for a quiet walk by myself or, you know, stepping into the wet grass first thing in the morning in my bare feet and seeing if the, the buds are coming out of the sycamore trees that line the river, just small things. But I would try and find some things every day that, um, that were hopeful. I suppose bringing you into the present moment because grief so often is either in the past or the future it's either lamenting the past that we want back I want to be pregnant still or lamenting the future that we're we 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 want and we can't have mm -hmm. and um you know I want to come back to the nature but not for a little while sure. Is that, sure. I, I think it's really important some of the things you've said Kathy you talked about shame Oh, I hear that so often, like the shame, you know, that we carry, we some, somehow as women, as mothers internalize that it's our fault, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. I've spoken about this before many times in the podcast. I don't know a single mother whose child has died, um, born or unborn, who hasn't blamed themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and it's almost like it's easier to blame myself um, rather than accept the chaotic nature of the world or the, that we're not in control. Despite our best efforts, we're just not in control. And then also, you know, you talk there about miscarriage being a tricky kind of grief, one that's not really recognized or nobody has died who was alive, mm -hmm. but it's a, a massive loss, a massive loss, a massive bereavement. And we call it in... in the theory disenfranchised grief you know it's that grief where something profound has been lost yet society doesn't really recognize it you know and like you say you know gestation is no measure of law of love you know and it's so true I think many people will identify with you know, when you see those two lines on that pregnancy test it's like you are now this baby's mother and this is very real and all the hopes and dreams and plans for the future are are so they're they're as real as anything you know as if you have a 10 year old and you're imagining what they're going to be like when they're when they're older um all these little glimpses of our future are assumptions about the future which in an instant get shattered you know um, and it, it leaves us on very shaky ground. You said you were raging with the world, you know, and for some people, their anxiety goes sky high. For others, they're raging. For others, you know, they feel like they're going a little bit mad. I definitely did. Yeah. I've, seen that, yeah, I've, definitely. Seen, that, mm -hmm. I've seen that in friends who are trying to conceive mm -hmm. and just the process of IVF for some people can be absolutely brutal on your mental health. And you can feel with the, the cocktail of hormones, like you are going a little bit insane. Yeah. yeah. Speak yeah. to me about your experience of that, Kathy, would you? Yeah, I mean, you know, you talk about, yes, I definitely had a lot of anxiety as well. Rage and anger was one side of it. Anxiety was another side of it because, you know, it got to the point where everything felt so unsafe. You know, everything felt so wobbly. And, and I remember, you know, if the boys, if there was a loud noise or, you know, something fell or Lego box crashed or or the boys came in, you know, with a scraped knee from the woods, my, it was almost like my fight, flight or fight, um, you know, response had been triggered so much by these sort of, what were traumatic experiences, I went from not to 60 in a second. So I, I was worried about them all the time. Even simple things like, you know, if they weren't with me, um, are they safe? Are they well? Are they okay? They would have a swimming lesson. Are they going to be okay? You know, everything just felt unsafe. And, and, and sometimes I could be in the middle of, you know, doing something normal, like at the supermarket, but 
I might be, what, what am I doing here? What, what, what is, what, I would look around me and just think, what is the point? What is the point? You know, just, and I would, might just walk out the door again and sit in the car for a while. And yeah, it, 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 there were all of these really complicated feelings going on. And I honestly, I, I, I didn't know how I was, I was, the only thing that made sense to me was to get pregnant again you know so that was like causing its own sort of anxiety and you know I've talked to a lot of women in my own work about just the whole cycle of you know fertility treatment and um you know trying to get pregnant it not working out it, it, it you know a pregnancy ending and you know this is such a tough it's such a tough area and I think you know it's not grief related but I think we we as women we need to be kinder to one another about we are enough you know that's that's the lesson we you know you're not you're not failing that even the language around the pregnancy ending it's a failure you know that's you know so that, that and then you internalize that i think yes it's nature it's, it's as natural as a baby coming into the world but but we're not really we're not really told that and i think if we just were kinder to one another i i don't take anything for granted now in terms of when it comes to the word of fertility, if, if I if I see a woman and I think, oh, you know, what's going on there? I don't make assumptions. I don't make, I don't ask questions. I try to be really non-judgmental because this is a hard road and you don't know what, you know, part of that road she's on. It is really difficult. It is laden with, with awful potholes and, and, and grief. So I think the, the, the last thing, I'm just really quiet about that. If, if someone wants to talk, and I think as well as that, it's kind of why I wanted to, to share my story. I've asked people to share their stories with me for so many years as a journalist, but I also felt, you know, if I'm going to write this book, I've got to be really honest about what went on here in these years of trying and, and longing and, and being grief stricken and sad and, and, you know, and healing ultimately. I, I, I would like to say, Liz, I will never get over what happened. I will never, some of those very traumatic experiences, um, you know, after, you know, certain miscarriages, um, I'll never get over the loss, but I've incorporated them into my life in a way that they're part of it. They're, you know, those little lives will always be with me, but I've accepted that they're part of our story. They're part of our family story. We talk about them and we honor them. You know, you talk about making meaning. So, you know, we have little places that we go to light candles and to, to lay some flowers and, and, and one of our, you know, our, our tiny um, little um, babies is, is, is in our back garden and I've, you know, created a little headstone and I've put little boxes and badgers and like little statues around it it's a, it's a lovely place to go and and it's um so making meaning and rituals around these lives and talking about the, these little people who are part of our family to my sons is really important as well you know that they were big brothers to these other um little people as well you know and, and I firmly believe I'm, I'm not overly religious but I am deeply spiritual and I do so say um, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm overly religious, although I do feel that there have been times where, you know, going to the church and doing things like lighting candles and, um, you know, has been really helpful. But I, I, I am really spiritual. So for me, you know, um, I go to the woods and I, and I seek little signs in nature. And, um, and sometimes a fox shows up just when I'm thinking about one of my, my lost babies. And, uh, for me, those little signs in nature are, they're reminding me that life is unfolding just exactly as it should. And I take great solace from those signs in nature. You know, maybe the seal popping up its head when I'm swimming. And, you know, I, I love to see these because they remind me that, you know, life is just, it's, it's, it's ebbing and flowing. And, and, and the little things that happen, the big things that happen, these are all just part of the process. And I, I try and I try and let them go more now. I try and, and and be in the moment more and not and not meet it with huge resistance, if that makes sense. Um, so there's been a lot of learning. There's been a really big learning curve. It sounds the, like you've and, developed flexibility to to your lack of control in the world. Yeah. Okay, here's what's happening. But yeah. one of the I things think, you Yeah, I think I was a bit of a control freak, Liz, you know. I think that, you know, in my in my previous life 
um, and, and work, um, you know, as a journalist in, in, in newsrooms, you know, there was, you know, you had your day, you had, you know, the story, you went out, you did certain things, you might have pushed the rock to the top of the hill and watched it roll back down again. Um, but, you, you know, everything was quite controlled. There wasn't any great, you know, there were, yeah, things could go wrong. But in terms of these sort of life experiences, the rug being pulled from under you, that, that, that wasn't the case. So these, these, these things happening to me just seemed to come out of nowhere. And I realized that, you know, you, you can't control everything. You know, you, you in fact control very little. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm still, I try to control the controllables in my day, you know, pick up the kids when they're actually picked up. But, but I do also try and let go of a lot of stuff. You know, I try not to get too worked up about the small stuff. I suppose I'm I I trying think, to get the moment more. You've just summarized the serenity prayer, basically, haven't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, there's, you know, one thing when we're talk talking about recurrent miscarriage or trying IVF or desperately trying to get pregnant, it can become really obsessive, like it's all consuming. You're either, you know, you're always at some stage of the cycle, but you're never just off having a break. And it can be so like it's it can be so charged because of the hopes, the grief, the fear, that nervous system that you describe, like just being on the edge of your nerves, you know, everything setting you off like it's an awful way to be in the world and it can endure for quite a long time. And actually all that will fix it is to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. But yet it's it's also the source of more trauma when that line doesn't appear or you get your period or whatever happens. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, you know, you can't win because there is this delicate balance of hope mm -hmm. and not giving up hope. And then yet inflicting grief upon grief on ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for many people, they have to come to a point of when is enough enough? For me, you know, how, how, how far can I go with trying, you know, and, and will I be sane at the end of this, you know, you, do you know what I'm trying to say? I know, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, and for us, we met that point. But, you know, one of the things I, I thought, you know, that the, the best thing will be to get pregnant again, but getting pregnant wasn't a safe place either because it was so riven with stress. So there was no enjoyment in any of it, you know, there was no enjoyment in all of that, you know, that time, even not pregnant, you want to be pregnant when you are pregnant, you're so stressed out, is it going to end the same way? So the whole thing just becomes this really, really difficult, um, just your waking hours become so fraught, you know, and for us, I suppose, you know, we had to reach a point where we said, you know, enough is enough, enough is enough now, you know, um, we... I came to a point of realization and it wasn't just like one day that that's it end of the line it was a sort of a slower process of realizing you know I have to live for me I have a husband I have two children who need me to be more present you know I have got to let go of this because how far down the road am I going to go before this just you know this is it's not that I could never say it was not worth it because you know, there's days where I would still wake up and say, you know, I, I would have loved that third child and, you know, that little person who, who, who was, we thought was going to be part of our family, but we had to just let go. We had to just say enough. This is going to kill me. This is literally, it's enough. I can't do this anymore to myself or to my husband. And, and part of me, you know, you know, there's a, there's a guilt that comes with that as well is because I feel like I, pushed us down this road so far driven by my needs and my yearnings because you know um of course my husband would have would have been delighted if we had had another baby but for him the yearning wasn't like this huge need that I had so I part of me feels like did I cause so much of this angst in our lives did I bring a lot of this grief on us because of my unrelenting desire for another baby but all I can say I've said it before the heart wants what it wants and it took us on this journey that's the journey we went on and luckily 
we had one another, even though I definitely, we, you know, we were moving in our own little separate orbits for a while, but we came back to one another and we found, you know, the, the, the fun that we used to have together and the, the crack and the, you know, and the, the best friend in one another again. And, and we let that go. It's that it was sad to let it go. And it, it was a, you know, but once we let it down, it was, it was the beginning of the healing process, I suppose. Mm. There's yeah. something about yearning, which is keeping hope alive or striving for something, you know, and I know with prolonged grief disorder, one of the main symptoms is just this constant yearning, you know, to, backwards looking yearning, if only this, you know, this sort of narrative in our heads and you know, it, 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 in a way it stops the grief coming in fully because we're still hoping, we're still yearning. We still think if I keep this up enough, maybe something will happen. If I yearn enough, maybe they won't be dead. Or if I yearn enough, maybe another baby will come. But actually yearning is something that can really be quite problematic for us because it's not allowing us to live in our present moment. Like all we have is right now and then the next right now and then the next right now. And of course we need to sort of look back and learn and look forward and have hope and purpose, you know, but really we only have now. And if we're never living our lives in now, we are just in our future or are in our past with our heads and missing so much. And, you know, I think when we're yearning, it is, it's either we're future, focused or we're past focused but we're not just seeing what's in front of us mm -hmm. and I really would like to bring it back to what you were saying then of you know use the word healing for some people that can be quite triggering because it's like we don't heal from grief I, I, we can integrate grief you yeah. know and for some people to use the word healing is absolutely appropriate to heal this period of my life whatever you know works for individuals mm -hmm. but you talked about finding healing in the starling, in the sea, in the natural world. And this is so important. And it's back to what you started with, Kathy, of lying in your college dorm, crying for the land that you grew up in. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you probably find yourself in a cement student campus going, where's that familiar land, you know? Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, I don't know if you know the work of Francis Weller, he does lovely grief work, um, but he talks about like mm. the gates of grief in our lives where there's different gates that bring us into grief. And one of them is obviously the death of someone we love or miscarriage, you know, the end of the life. But also there's the, the loss of the land, mm. you know, of like all of our ancestors yeah. grew up in the natural world and it's only 0.01% of humanity that has been urbanized. So our DNA hasn't caught up to that yet. We're still living, our DNA still wants to be in that natural world. Mm. You know, and there is a loss of that. Yeah. But interestingly, that's where you found solace. Mm. Yeah. Talk to us about that, Kath. I, I, lo I love what you say about the DNA and, you know, um, the ancestors, you know, um, I, I grew up in the, the house that I live in now was my, my great aunt's house we, we 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 live here now and she was like my granny when we were growing up you know she was just the most wonderful woman who um fostered in me a, a great love of reading she used to buy me a, a a new book every week and I used to write down the name of the book and, and she would take it to the shops and get me my book she was just incredible but um this place for me you know um it's very rich I feel them all around me now the ancestors because there's a little woods behind us and there's the river beside us where the, there's rock hewn steps down to where my ancestors would have washed you know they would have washed the clothes and you know I live across the road from Loch Foyle where my family held the first salmon fishing licenses so this place is a place of, of deep deep roots for me and deep meaning so coming back here um you know it and I was blind to it when I was going through I think what we were going through you know but now I feel that it is such a I'm I'm I'm, I'm wary about using the word healing again because I, I wouldn't like it to be triggering for for anyone 
solace might be the word solace might be something that I could that I could say I find a huge solace in being in a place where ha, that has such deep roots for me and you know my people are, are, are from here but also around me there's there's so much natural beauty I mean you know Donegal is is incredible I live in a peninsula where the light changes every two minutes where you know there are so many opportunities to get out and be in your own I don't have to go very far to find a very big expanse where I am literally the only human being there you know so so for me the landscape and I never feel lonely on my own that's that's something that I think grief has taught me a connection with myself that that you know gr growing up I was a very connected to myself kind of kid I loved being on my own I was um, really happy in the woods or at the shore I would spend or could while away hours of time just throwing stones in the water and, and just digging for sand beetles or gathering shells or looking at anemones or, you know, lots of, I, that was the kid that I was. And I think, as you, you know, as you get older, you move away, you forget that that child that you were. And I was that wild girl. I, I really was never happier than when jumping over a fence or hopping into the woods. Or, and I think the one thing that I realized on the journey that I've been on is that that connection with nature and the wildness has come has, has come back through adversity and I think I went to look for her again if that doesn't sound too woo woo that that I, I knew that that the, the the healing the solace the wild world out there was going to be brilliant but I had to I had to connect with with myself and then get out there and and see through almost like those child's eyes again at this beauty that had been in my life so that was um that was a great comfort and a great solace and yes the ocean and the woods and the wild places and going to the river and even just for me just simple things like the river that flows past our house there's a huge big rock in the middle of the river and um the rock is implacable it is like this huge force and the water just moves around it and if ever i'm really stuck or i'm lacking courage for something or feeling a bit down i go and i sit by the river and I watch the way the water flows around it. And then I just say, right, you know, move like water in the world. Let, let it go, let it go. The water is not gonna go through the rock. It's not gonna try and break it down with like a sledgehammer, but it will find its way to the sea. It will find its way. And I try in, in the trials and tribulations of, of daily life and the things that come up, I try and move like water in the world more now and I let things go and these, Nature has been a great teacher of, of letting go and watching the ocean and the ebb and the flow. Um, you know, what, what goes out will come back in and it's a constant movement. And I, I find great comfort in all of that, if that makes sense. Oh, 100%. It's beautiful listening to you, Kathy. I shared, like you so kindly invited me to your book launch last week and I wasn't able to go because I'm doing this forest bathing training. And um, yeah, I knew you'd be really interested in that as well, but it's like what you're describing is something that you knew in your bones. Mm -hmm. Like I am at ease in nature, you know, I find solace in nature. There's a belonging for me with nature, you know, but the science also confirms all of that. And I, so many people that I've interviewed on the podcast or for my grief training program, you know, say this as well it's not in people, it's not in places, although it's lovely when people don't forget us, because mm -hmm. they sometimes do. But ultimately, it's a very personal inner journey, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and to find that connection with nature back to our source, mm -hmm. you know, back to where we've come from, back to what we're made of, you know, to be amongst the fractals in nature again, and just find that familiarity where it matches our DNA, you know really strongly and I, I talk in the book Liz you know I, I talk about a homecoming you know how you know that the the book is you know finding my way to how, how I moved to the edge brought me home but for me the homecoming in the book is not just about a physical place it's it's about my own opening my own heart to myself and falling in love with my own life again you know and and the wonder that was around me and, and that, you know, going back to that wild self and nurturing that again. So home is very much 
definitely in the chambers of your own heart, which for me, I had locked myself out of because I blamed and shamed myself. I, I was very upset and angry with my body. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't welcome myself. I couldn't do something as simple as sit with myself without feeling angry. So a homecoming is now for me, it's about feeling that deep connection with my own heart, even just sometimes putting my hand on my heart and, and hearing it beating and feeling so grateful for that. And that is my home. That has to be, if that is not a comfortable place to be, then there is nowhere else in the world that is going to be comfortable for you. So I really come back to that, you know, and, and try and try and just remember that every day. Mm, gorgeous. Such wisdom there, Kathy. And, you, you know, it's a really familiar theme for many women who have lost a baby um, or who have had a miscarriage. This sense of, you know, losing faith in your body, you know, losing trust in your body, that innocence being shattered as well when it's the first time where we just assume things going to work out, you know, um, and it, it's, yeah, it, it's like a loud bell is rung in the ears going, what do you mean it won't always work out as, like planned? But mm -hmm. I know that I used to support many women who had lost a baby in the National Maternity Hospital and they would refer them to me for support afterwards. And often I just intuitively, almost before they would sit down, I'd say, shall we walk? You know, and because so many women said, you know, just talked about losing their inner strength, losing trust in their bodies, not wanting to go out, not wanting to move and to walk in nature and find symbolism in nature and metaphor in nature while walking, while using the body turned out to be really, really therapeutic. Um, because pregnancy is it's a really pregnancy loss is so different to other losses because it is so physical mm -hmm. you know and you can be bearing your baby and standing there with a very changed body or a body that's prepared to be feeding this baby and holding this baby and um, so at a, a very biological level mm -hmm. everything can be screaming um, and everything you know when I interviewed Brenda Casey, a midwife from the National Maternity Hospital for the grief training program, something she said really jumped out. The greatest paradox is death before birth or death before life. You know, it's just not the way it's meant to be. Yeah. Um, so it can really, really send us into a spin. Yeah, what, I think, yeah, I, I, I just what you said resonates so much. And for me, you know, my body became like a battleground so it's like this is the place where you're supposed to grow and nurture your babies but this is also the, 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 the place where they they died you know um so for me my body felt I was almost I was so angry and dejected and left down and I didn't love I, I, I certainly didn't nurture my body I wasn't kind but one thing and I know we've talked a lot about nature but what really did huge hugely helped me was um was swimming and, and I write a lot in the book about you know swimming and the first time I got into the water and the cold water and my journey has been from you know a very kind of dipper to a, a kind of a, an endurance swimmer so I'm, I'm you know I'm a, a confident swimmer now and what, what has been such a revelation is that I can trust my body to do this job um, I get into water and it, it doesn't just do it well it does it really well like it's it's um I'm you know I'm a confident you know good swimmer and I can I, I love that feeling it's, to me it's the closest thing to flying that they can be you kick off and off you go and I feel so powerful and I feel so at ease and instead of waging a war with my body I'm so grateful for the job that it does you know and uh, I, I, I love that sense of of almost like a full revolution um, that swimming has brought me this sense of acceptance and treating my body well because it does a really good job for me and instead of you know fighting with it and being annoyed and let down I, I do care for it I, I try and eat well I you know I exercise I, I go to the sea as many times as I can and 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 it's just it has been a full full kind of u-turn really but one that that took time and was a learning in itself of trusting again you know gorgeous 
And Kathy, you launched your book just last week. Uh How has it been? I've heard it can be a terrifying experience. And I know your book is endorsed by the lovely Ruth Fitzmaurice. You know, I I mean, and I have you to thank for introducing me to Ruth. Um, And she's been incredibly supportive. In fact, I have had the most powerful response to the book. Um, You know, Liz, women, men, people like just have inundated me with messages of support and they've read extracts from the book which you know the Irish Independent published um, a couple of weekends ago and I've just been completely blown over by the love and support and but what's really strange has ha- thing that happened and I want to share this with you Anna, um, it's that I thought that by putting all this out there you know some of the most personal things that happened that I was going to feel like I need to pull the duvet up over the head. How could you say that in, in, in your book and put that out there into the world? The weird thing is, I feel I feel more comfortable. I feel more confident. I feel more rooted. I feel more, it's almost like the sense of, I put it out there instead of it being this weakness that, that I, I, I saw these things as, as weaknesses or vulnerabilities, they've almost come back to me. And give me this cape which is like a superhero's cape and it's like I am just I, I it's a bit like what Brandy Brown talks about like our, our vulnerabilities become our greatest strength if we can share them and, and with an open heart and I decided when I was going to share this story that it was going to be with an open heart and a lot of the time what came out was just so free-flowing that I don't think it came from my head I honestly I I, I don't think I think and when you're led with your heart and you're being vulnerable and you're sharing the best of intentions the, 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 the love that I have got back has buoyed me up so much and I feel I, I do not feel anything but just powerful is the wrong word I just feel so I just feel so just amazingly comforted and and this wave that has met me of pure love it's it's incredible and it is so rewarding and the fact that it's resonating with people that is all I wanted from this process. That is what I wanted was to share, be brave, put it out there and just let it find its people. And I think it is, you know. Yeah, oh, it's lovely, Kathy. And I, you know, I wasn't at the launch, but I did go onto social media the next day yeah. and I looked you up to see was there pictures from the launch or what were you saying about it? And there you were in the sea. And then the next day there was a picture of you with or of starlings. And I thought, isn't that great? She's just gone through this big momentous process in her life and it's still back to the ground, back to the sea, back to the sky. You were, it it clear to me that you were using nature as an anchor as you always do throughout this process. And you know, that's what, you know, before I left to go to the book launch, feeling the fear a little bit, I went to the woods and I took a beautiful oak leaf from the ground and I put it in the pocket that I was going to be wearing that night. So my, my woods were going to, I was going to have a little talisman from them with me. And when I came home, I went out and looked at the stars and looked at the moon. And we have a, tra- you know, in my family, there was a tradition that whenever you went away, you came home and you bathed your feet in the waters of Loch Foy to anchor yourself again. That's something all of my, you know, you know, there were members of my family who emigrated and that's what they did. They used to go and wash their feet. Um, to come home so I I very much did that so I I rooted myself back down again so that I can give myself wings and hopefully you know spread the the word of this book and it finds its people and gives people hope and comfort and that that would be that would do my heart good so for anybody listening it's Kathy Donaghy finding my wild available from the best bookstores Um, (laughs) And if people abroad want to buy it, Kathy, what's the best online place to buy it? You know, I think Eason's online. I know that I, I actually was just checking the other day. Liz and Amazon have it as well, but Eason's definitely has it. And um, I'm sure, you know, there are all your local bookshop will, will be able to get it in, you know, and it, it's definitely out there in the world, easily accessible. So I, I don't think there should be any problem. Great. And, you know, I used to often say, Kathy, at the end of podcasts, you know, sometimes chatting with people, you know, what advice would you give someone going through multiple losses at the moment? Or, But I, I don't think it's a question of giving advice. I think the best we can do is live our own authentic lives 
and whoever finds inspiration from that will find inspiration from that mm -hmm. you know there, there's what works for you won't work for someone else but there's many people listening today who just might mm -hmm. go down to the beach and put their toes in mm -hmm. or just might sit outside in their garden this evening and reconnect somehow mm -hmm. and so precious gift to Thank share you. your I'm so delighted to have been with you today Best of luck with the book and I look forward to chatting again, Kathy. Thank you, Liz.